Well, good morning and welcome as we join together as God's people once again and have this opportunity to worship and praise our Savior Jesus. I pray that that's exactly what you get to do no matter where you're at. If you're viewing this from home, uh, we are still in this together as God's people. That's what makes us the church. We can continue to live as his body here on earth no matter where we're at. And of course, I pray that you're doing that in other ways as well as you live out your faith. Um, as a part of that, I'd like to just remind you some of the ways that you have an opportunity to live out that faith in Christ. Um, as we get closer to Holy Week, um, we have a number of opportunities that we're offering that are different than in previous years. That's right. Uh, even in the midst of a pandemic, we are adding opportunities. That's really been one of the things we've challenged ourselves with uh, throughout this past year. How can we become creative? And one of those things is actually bringing back something that we've done in the past, and that is the prayer vigil. Now, it's not going to be like it's been done years past in the sense of the time that it covers, but we're going to offer an opportunity for those who would like to sign up by way of our website, or you can call the office as well, where you can have a half an hour where you come into the church and pray, and we'll have prayer requests that can help guide some of the things that you pray, the topics uh, that you cover. Um, but that'll take place from 9 until midnight on Good Friday, and then from 6 a.m. till 9 a.m. on Holy Saturday. So it'll just be those three-hour segments. So if you'd like to take part in that prayer vigil, take time to come into the church. Uh, we'll have an elder here as well. Uh, we certainly welcome you to, uh, uh, to do that. Um, also, as we approach Easter weekend, we will be adding two services. We're going to add uh, the vigil of Easter worship service at 5 o'clock on Saturday, Holy Saturday. That's the 3rd of April. Um, it is not like the Easter Sunday services, but it leads into that. It's a very unique um, and uh, really just a, an awesome uh, experience to be able to go through one of those services. And so I encourage you to take part in that. Uh, again, that'll be at 5 o'clock on Saturday. And then because we are not having our traditional Easter breakfast here on site, uh, we are going to add an additional Easter Sunday service at 8.30 a.m., which means we'll worship at 7, at 8.30, and then at 10.30. And if you're still interested in an Easter breakfast, we are making that available. Our youth are going to be preparing uh, basically prepackaged um, uh, meals that you can take home with you. So let us know if you'd like one of those. Just feel free to reach out. Again, check out the website. You can find out uh, pretty much information on all those things and then some. So again, as we live out our faith in Christ, lots of opportunities to do that. Um, but let's worship now as God's people. Let's rise. Let's stand wherever you're at, if you're able, and join in our opening hymn, Blessed Jesus at Your Word.
Once again, we begin by reflecting on our baptism into the name of our triune God. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We join together now in our song of praise. The Lord be with you, we pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for today is taken from the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, beginning at verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, 
of the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that, your, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning at verse 18. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of his age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I invite you to stand now for the Holy Gospel, which is taken from the Gospel of St. John, the 19th chapter. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to, the, said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may certainly be seated as we join together now in our next hymn.
Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you once again from God our Father and, of course, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, when it comes to Mary, the mother of our Savior, have you ever wondered how much she really knew, how much she really understood? I mean, how much did she really understand and comprehend when it came to who her son, this Jesus, who he really was? I mean, of course, certainly she had been surrounded by all kinds of clues, all kinds of indicators, if you will, that her son was not just like any other man. I mean, for example, like that visit from the angel when she was told that she would bear a son who would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's not normal. I mean, it had to be by way of the Holy Spirit, didn't it? After all, more than anyone else on this planet, Mary knew she had never been with a man. And then there was Joseph's change of heart. You know, one moment he's trying to make sense of everything that Mary is telling him, everything that Mary's claiming as in regard to carrying that child that had been conceived in a manner that goes way beyond human reason. And the next moment, Joseph is right there by her side as she gives birth to Jesus. And of course, there's even more. The shepherds surrounding the stable, the appearance of those magi, those wise men who gave gifts that were not really typically gifts at, given to a nor, newborn baby. And then there's the escape to Egypt following another angelic visit to her husband. It really does make you wonder how much Mary really understood, how much she knew. After all, there were so many occurrences that were unique to her son, even as he grew into a man. That temple visit when he was 12, where Jesus stayed back in Jerusalem to be in his father's house, as he explained it. And then the miracles as a man. You ever wonder what Mary saw that maybe we don't know about? I don't want to speculate too much because we can't. But do you ever wonder what it was that led her then to so confidently and boldly tell all those servants at the wedding at Cana to do as her son told them when it came to taking care of that shortage of wine? What did she see? What did she know? When she and Joseph brought Jesus to Jerusalem as an infant, was she able to fully grasp and comprehend what that old man Simeon was really saying when he said that her son would be appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and a sign to be spoken against and that a sword would pierce her own soul too? You ever wonder what Mary really knew? How much she really understood? Did she ever grasp that her son, this miracle worker, this great teacher, would be hanging from a cross? Because, you know, as we focus on our text for today from John's Gospel, that's exactly where we find Mary's son. Jesus is now hanging from a cross, nailed to those horrible wooden beams. That's where he's heading. And for what reason? Was it treason? Was it betrayal? Uh, was it because of some kind of criminal act? No. It wasn't any of those things. That we can absolutely be sure of. In fact, Mary would have known better than anyone else that her son was not a criminal. He was not a liar. He was not a thief who deserved to be nailed to that cross at all. And no doubt Mary would have known better than anyone that her son of all people deserved nothing like this. She, like the disciples and so many others, would have at least understood that the only thing that Jesus could ever be rightly accused of were things like acts of generosity, acts of mercy, acts of grace, acts of love. That's also why I'm certain that Mary could have never imagined that we, she would be standing in front of that bloodstained cross where her badly beaten son was hanging. In fact, I'm convinced that there simply could have never been any way for Mary to rightly and fully comprehend what Simeon, that old man back in Jerusalem when Jesus was an infant, what he meant when he said that because of her son, she would experience the pain of having her own soul pierced as by a sword. And that's why I would agree with something that was written by an author and also a pastor, pastor, author, by the name of Mark Roberts when he once wrote, the presence of Mary at the cross adds both humanity and horror to the scene. We're reminded that Jesus was a real human being, a man who had once been a boy who had been carried in the womb of his mother. Even as he was dying on the cross as the Savior of the world, Jesus was also a son 
a role he did not neglect in his last moments. And for all that we don't know, there is one thing that we can say with certainty when it comes to Mary. No matter what, she was still Jesus' mom. Her role didn't go away. It didn't go away when, she tried to, you know, when he tried to tell her and his dad, Joseph, that the temple was really his father's house. Nor did she become any less his mom when he began his public ministry and performed those miracles and shared those great teachings. Her role as Jesus' mother did not become negated when he healed the sick or when he taught with authority, when he fed the masses and even command, commanded the wind and the waves to obey him. Just as her role as his mother didn't go away when he walked on water and turned water into wine, Mary was still very much his mother and Jesus was still very much her firstborn son. That's why, as Pastor Roberts goes on to write, when we think of the crucifixion of Jesus from the perspective of his mother, our horror increases dramatically. The death of a child is one of the most painful of all parental experiences. To watch one's beloved child experience the extreme torture of crucifixion must have been unimaginably terrible. That's also why, when it comes to what we hear and see within our gospel reading for today from John, it becomes difficult for us to glorify what's really unfolding on the cross. Now, this particular moment seen through the eyes of a mother, it doesn't allow us to glorify or even spiritualize the crucifixion at this point. Suddenly, this is so much more than just a mere picture of a Savior hanging from a Roman cross. Now, it becomes a horrific reality as, he wit as we witness a real man, true flesh and blood, a son of a mother dying with unbearable agony. And she, nor you and me, can do anything to stop it. You see, it's one thing for us to ponder, to think about, maybe even possibly gloss over the crucifixion of Jesus. But when we realize that he was as real as any other man and his mother was as real as any other mom, it can almost become too real. But it can at least help us understand why Mary was there, why she still stood nearby at the foot of that cross. While we find none of her other children there and only one of the 12 disciples present, at least we can now begin to understand why she would not, why she refused to abandon her child, her son, Mary was a real mother, just as Jesus was a real son. And the reality was that whether she understood more or not, she was about to see her son take his last breath. But not before we witness something amazing. Something that once again makes ever so clear that this Jesus was more than just simply Mary's son. Not before we hear yet another verbal piece of hard evidence that he was still fulfilling what he had come to do as the Son of God and the Son of Man. And the proof is in his words, where he turns to her and says, Woman, behold your son, pointing to John, and telling John, Behold your mother. Now, I understand that at first these words appear to be just simple words of care and concern from an oldest son who wants to make sure that his mom is being taken care of. I mean, there's no doubt that that was certainly important. In fact, it was a big thing in Jesus' day and his culture. The fact that Jesus uh, addresses the possibility that his mother will need somebody to take care of her is what would be expected by an oldest child, especially if his mother happened to be a widow. But today, in the midst of this most traumatic scene, I don't want you to miss that there's something even more. Don't miss the fact that while Jesus is watching out for his mother by having his close friend John take care of her, he is in fact still fulfilling God's law on our behalf. Even after having been beaten badly, nearly to death, after carrying that cross to Golgotha and then being nailed to that horrible cross, Jesus continues to fulfill the law by honoring his mother as any son was required to do. More so, don't miss the fact that as Jesus, Jesus then does honor his mother and fulfills his role as a true son, 
He doesn't just simply leave the care of his mom to her other children, who, by the way, are nowhere to be seen. No, instead of leaving his mother to those who have fled the scene of the crucifixion where their own brother has been unjustly condemned to die, he turns not to a family member, but rather to a friend, John, a true brother, one who in faith has not abandoned our Lord's side. And I've wondered... I wondered, could it be that John was chosen by Jesus over Mary's other children, who, by the way, are named in Matthew 13, 55, and Mark 6, verse 3? Just so you know, I'm just not making this up. She did have other children. Could it be that John was chosen over them because he exhibited faith, a faith not yet found in the others? While John was most likely poorer than Mary's other children after having lived a life as a Christ follower for those previous few years, could it be that what Jesus was most concerned about regarding his mother's well-being was something more than just her earthly care? <clears throat> could it be that John was chosen because while dying on the cross, Jesus still had more concern for the spiritual and eternal well-being of a woman like that of Mary than he had for her economic well-being? There's no doubt about it. These are questions worth considering, worth looking at, exploring, because is that not the very reason that Jesus went to the cross to begin with for all of us? Didn't our Lord allow our spiritual well-being, our eternal well-being, to trump the fact that even his own mother would have to stand by and witness his sacrifice, all so that, along with she, we could have our lives rewritten forever in his blood? I'm telling you those words that he spoke from the cross, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. They reveal much more than a man simply looking out for his mom and her earthly well-being. These words remind us first that this crucifixion was all too real and that the one who was being crucified that day was offering more than just words of care. These words are proof they are hard evidence once again that this Jesus who would take it upon himself to assure that his mother's physical and spiritual well-being were in good hands is the same perfect son of God who has made sure that our spiritual well-being is also in good hands. In fact, friends, our spiritual well-being, which has all to do with being made righteous in the sight of our Heavenly Father, is in hands that are far better than just good hands. Because of the same one who hung on that cross in front of his very own mother, you and I can be absolutely certain that our spiritual and eternal well-being as forgiven children are in the best hands of all. Our lives now, forever, are in the hands of the one who has engraved us in his palms for all eternity. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother, Jesus says. Friends in Christ Jesus, whenever you hear these words again, behold your precious, loving Savior, the one who has made you and me right again in the eyes of our Heavenly Father, assuring us that not only will we be cared for, but we are forever safe in the arms of, yes, Mary's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may that peace which transcends all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, if you're able, I invite you to stand as we confess our faith today in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, 
and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Once again, I would encourage you as my brothers and sisters, as you should encourage me as well, that we continue to live our lives in thanksgiving to what God has revealed to us once again today, that Jesus has come for us, he has lived for us, he has died for us, and he has given us the assurance that we are in the best hands ever, as he has made clear that our eternal well-being is solidified through his blood. And of course, as we live a life of thanksgiving and celebration, we then return that thanks by living the life that we've been called to live, which includes our giving, our giving of our lives, our time, our talents, treasures, uh, you name it. But I encourage you to give, and the same is true for me, to always be challenged with, how can I live my life for Jesus? How can I respond and show him that love that he's given to me? So with that said, let's go to our Lord in prayer. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, when we are tempted to betray our relationship with you and when we seek to merely make a name for ourselves, continue through your Holy Spirit to increase our faith that we may always cling to the cross, cling to you for hope, and know that you have come for our eternal well-being. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, teach us to see and understand the great blessings that you have poured out richly over all of us. And Lord, help us to always rely on you alone. Increase our gratitude and encourage us by way of your spirit to constantly be creative in the ways that we return these gifts, that we would be excellent caretakers of all that you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain us, good Lord, in our earthly journey as we struggle in our faith and life. Preserve us in the face of fear, in the presence of anguish and terror, that we may not be led into despair and hopelessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, no matter what challenges come our way, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that at life's end we may know with certainty that we will see your eternal embrace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, Savior Jesus, sustain and strengthen those in need of physical and emotional healing. Place upon their hearts and minds a peace from you that gives them the assurance of your presence at all times. If it be according to your good and gracious will, grant them all full and complete healing in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is one with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We continue now with our closing hymn. 